Well, our next speaker is uh, talking about uh, one of the applications of drone technology that is very important to Alberta's economy. Uh, Marcus Weber is talking about smart farming and the future of agriculture. Marcus Weber grew up on Wega Farms near Camrose, Alberta, which is a mixed grain and cow-calf operation. The farm was an early adopter for almost every kind of ag tech, from light bars to auto steer to RFID tags for full life tracking of their cattle. While Marcus has worked in many other fields, including a lawyer and in government, he has turned his passion for agriculture and technology into Landview drones. Landview sells complete farm-ready drone packages and provides the training to farmers and agronomists to use those systems effectively. Marcus will be speaking on smart farming and the future of agriculture. So Marcus, welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Um, hopefully my passion for agriculture comes through and uh, I love working at the synapse of technology and agriculture. Um, Landview Drones is a retailer essentially. We sell drones for agriculture. We're not stuck with DJI, but those of you that are in the drone space already, uh, right now we're selling DJI aircraft primarily. But most important, we provide training to the farmer to use those on their own farm. Um, as we started in the drone world back in 2015, we realized that there was a lot of uh, technological developments coming at us very quickly, uh, and there was a rush to get into the service industry, and that still exists to some degree. Um, people saw big numbers in agriculture, and I was really happy to see in Roger's um, presentation that pyramid of where the economic impact actually comes from. And the economic impact from drones is going to be very much like the economic impact of cell phones. It becomes a routine device that's going to be used, I venture to say, in every industry. And that's where the economic impact is going to come from primarily for Alberta, is every industry improving what they do by using a tool. And that's ultimately what the drone is. It's a resource carrier. It carries a payload of some sort for some kind of purpose and uh, uses the sky rather than the ground to do it. And uh, with that said, I'm going to get into the weeds in this presentation. I realize many, sorry, that was a joke, wasn't it? Um, I realize many of you are not from farms. Uh, I probably should have had a poll, but within this room at least, any farmers in here? All right. We've got four or five of you. I'm going to present to you largely as if, I, as if you were a group of farmers. Because I want you to understand how drones are actually being used. There are really lofty ag tech goals often, and you'll hear about smart farming, the future of farming, and how everything is going to change. Everything isn't going to change. Farmers are still growing crops. They're still putting a seed in the ground. They're still monitoring that seed. They're still managing that crop as it grows and producing a commodity that hopefully by then will have some more value-added processing in Alberta. My little plug there, rather than selling a community uh, commodity outside the province. But that's ultimately still what's happening. So as all of this technology comes into the to the forefront, drones being one of them, we get all kinds of companies that are scrambling for the ag tech space. And ag tech is that terminology that everybody's using. I just grabbed a few from the internet. Here's a whole bunch of companies doing ag tech. Notice they all have icons in common. They all have some kind of connection between those icons. And they promise the world often, right? And that's the big promise, is big money. Well, ag tech is not the answer, to, in my opinion. It is not the answer. It's not the only answer. It's just tech, and tech is a tool. It's one tool am amongst many. And I see many scrambling to become the, the big drone platform that's going to save, save agriculture. Well, first of all, agriculture doesn't need saving. It needs continuous improvement like, they've, like we have done for many millennia. Um, and ultimately, drones are just one of many tools that are out there for a farmer to be able to do better. So that's what I'm going to go through in the presentation, is I'm going to present to you in agriculture a little slice of what the drones are actually being used for. And that's going to include things like scouting and mapping, cattle monitoring. And ultimately, this one is happening incredibly quickly. We're going to see a lot of spraying and spreading of product. And uh, don't Google my name because you'll come up with quotes as recently as two years ago saying we'll never spray quarter sections with drones. 
I've changed my mind very quickly. <laughs> so when I meet somebody at a, at a trade show, farmers will come up to the booth and they'll go, what am I going to use your drones for? And I'll turn it back to them and say, what do you want to use a drone for? What do you think you'll use it for? And ultimately the answer is crop scouting or checking cows, one of those two. Because they know there's a camera on board, they know they can get to a distant place and they can see things that they can't see from the ground. They also say that because they just want to buy one and their wife or husband is standing next to them, so they want to convince themselves that they want one. This is what they actually use it for in the first year. Nice pictures of their cedar in the fall of their combine. <laughs> then they progress, they do videos. It's all wonderful stuff. Uh, family pictures are also a part of that. Um, one quick tip, if you are from a farm and you want better family pictures from a drone, just add canola. It's like adding bacon to food. That's as far as I get into taking pretty pictures in our ag drone school. We spend two days with farmers. We don't talk about the pretty picture stuff. We talk about actual uses. And our uses in agriculture are quite different from other industries often. So what you're looking at here is a picture from down in Maricopa, Arizona. I was doing, down there doing fancy ag tech stuff. We were flying, you know, $300,000 drones. I put up my little Mavic 3 just to take a picture because it was just released at the time and YouTube said, Top camera is useless. There's a 12 megapixel camera that has a seven times telephoto, and when you zoom in, things become unclear, so it's no good for our YouTube videos. Well, for agriculture, imagine a tool that without flying any further can go from this to that from the same tool. Well, now, suddenly, those farmers are right. They said, I'm going to use it for crop scouting. I'm going to use it for finding cows. Same thing with a crop. You zoom in 728 times, suddenly you're looking at the plant instead of the field, right? This is the biggest tool for agriculture from an imaging drone at this point. Anything that can let you zoom in and see the plant saves the farmer time, saves them money, lets them find problems that they didn't know they had. And knowing what's wrong with your farm is the, be the most important step to improving how you manage that crop. Of course, what you'll see on the internet if you type in farm drone is you'll get all kinds of promises of 30% less fertilizer, 30% higher yield, and ultimately most of that is based on mapping the entire field. And this does have a lot of value to farmers when they figure out how to do this. So we created our ag drone school back in 2016 because farmers were buying the drone and then using it to take pictures. When they could be buying the same drone, consumer drone, to produce data. So they use it for things like field mapping. You've got every location on there so you can measure exactly acres were seeded this spring um, on that field. Like, you go five minutes later, you've got a map. Um, this is a, a very concrete example, but somebody bought a seed drill where the pipes were hooked up the wrong way. So beautiful new night tech that was turning off sections of the seed drill. Only problem was when the pipes were hooked up this way, it was turning off the wrong end of the drill. And so his entire field looked like this when we went for insurance purposes to measure how bad the damage was. Same thing with measuring damage for spray drift. The drone is just a really quick way to assess damage in fields. And hail is kind of the holy grail. We're not quite there yet on how much impact there is in one location, but the spatial extent is easy enough to do. So there you go, there's the hail. Um, guided crop scouting is kind of one of the other holy grails for farmers. They'd love to be able to have the drone scout for them. And this is an example I did back in 2015 is if you hire someone to walk that field, they get a random sample of what's going on in that field by using a pattern like that. It's a diamond or a W pattern, usually is what a crop scout will do. And we're not talking drone here, we're talking feet on ground, walk across that field. If a farmer scouts their own field, the pattern looks more like that. They know their benchmark locations where they have a certain weed, and if the decision to be made is whether to put a certain chemical in the mix for controlling those weeds, they're gonna go to that location and not scout a random field scout. Then mid-season, the scouting pattern looks more like this. For everybody, canola is about this deep. Everybody may think that they want to go scout that field, but you get 10 feet into it and that's enough. You're back out, you figure out what you need to figure out. So the tool is really useful for accessing those really hard to access areas. On-farm trials is another great use. Um, Yield maps, for those of you that know something about agriculture, most combines now, when you buy them, it's standard equipment on there. So as the grain is entering the combine and being, being uh, separated from the straw, it measures exactly how much yield there is at that location. The GPS and RTK locate that, and they give you a map of what the yield is across that entire field. 
The problem with the yield map is you get that when you're combining. So you can learn all kinds of things of what might have been going on in, during that year. You can do a yield map in June with a drone. So great use for on-farm trialing. I realize I'm too passionate, I'm gonna run out of time, that's why I'm skipping a few. If you've got questions about what I skipped, uh, give me a call afterward. So this is another example. You see that striping in this, it's an NDVI map. Normalized Difference Vegetation Index. It's the most common of the vegetation indexes. That striping is from a chaff spreader on a combine that was improperly set two years before this map was created. So for two years, for two crops, they've had very inconsistent uh, crop on that field. The other way they can use a drone, and this is very lowbrow compared to all the lofty ag tech mapping, is just take your drone and get a video of the chaff spreader. Check your equipment. It's a beautiful tool, especially the newest generation of consumer drones, the, the Mini 3s or the Mavic 3s. You can have them actively tracking your equipment, put them right over the header, and you can see how the rain flows in, put them at the back of the common, and figure out how the straw's coming out. Ultimately, the drone's place in remote sensing in agriculture is, in this comparison between satellite and drone, biggest difference you see there probably is resolution, right? You get much higher resolution from a drone. But almost more importantly, you get timely information from a drone. From a satellite, revisits are, there's occasional, there is some that's available daily now, but it's usually three, five, seven days. And if there's cloud or if there's smoke, which we've had a lot of the last few years, you get no data from a satellite, and you can from a drone. So that's really where this, the drone is positioned compared to satellite for remote sensing. So we sell multispectral sensors that use very concrete bands of light uh, beyond the visual, so in the near-infrared range, where plants reflect very differently. You can see that in the underlying chart here. The healthy and the unhealthy plants reflect that near-infrared light differently. And we use that principle to create maps of what's going on in a field. Skip a few of those as well. Um, 3D modeling. modeling. This comes, there was, I noticed there was a question about land surveyors and their adoption. I mean, that's one of those industries where early on we saw a lot of resistance, questioning what, how could a drone possibly be as accurate as what I've, I've learned to do and been doing for 30 years, walking across a gravel pile with my rover. You don't hear that anymore. The surveying companies are all internalizing the drone as one of their tools. It's, very, it's a very standard piece of equipment now, and that happened within the last five years. Very rapid adoption. So farmers get the benefit of all these other industries developing it. Farmers weren't about to develop the ability through photogrammetry to create a 3D model for modeling a, in this case, silage pit. But hey, the tool is there. It's a $3,000 tool that can let you measure that silage pit from above, and it'll tell you exactly how much silage you got left. So just to keep it interesting, we're guessing game. These are some of the things you can find on the internet. Do you think that uh, herding sheep works really well with a drone? Hands up if you think it'll work well. Only a few votes for this. That's it. pasture until somebody in New Zealand figured out that there's a better way. He just puts the drone over a gate before he opens the gate to new pasture. So he just flies ahead of the sheep and they follow the drone around. Beautiful. Herding sheep work well. What do you think of herding cattle? All right, more hands up now. Excellent. Um, and it's, it's species, it is uh, the, the, the gender of the animal often, uh, their age, and it, with cows, for example, everyone is different. Some will attack it, some will run away from it, some will just stand there. It doesn't work very well. How about you herding yaks? <laughs> if you haven't tasted yak meat yet, Fleet Country Farms in, near Castor, just north of here, produce these, and this is my buddy Dave. He's single too for the ladies. <laughs> so 
So we had to grow them. We just had to try it. Don't fly on days like this. Icing conditions right there. Uh, three minute flight and we had a thick layer of ice on the front. One of the problems we still need to solve for drone use in Alberta. And uh, last guessing game here. What do you think? Can it be used for bison genetics? Bison is a huge industry here in Alberta and growing. Here's a very simple use. We used to have bison on our farm. My dad would send me out with a quad, or sorry, it was a trike back then, a Honda, and binoculars, and I'd try to, try to figure out which ones had calved and write those down in a little notebook. Well, now you can take a drone, zoom right in, take a picture of the cow that doesn't have a calf by her side, and suddenly we have culling records. When we finally bring them in for TB testing, that one gets shipped. Very simple use, and again, this is enterprise level uh, drone, so about $15,000 tool, but it's a very feasible with very low cost technology. Um, thermal cameras are being used on drones as well, so if you want to find cattle, if you want to chase cattle, uh, you can do that at night, you can do it in low lighting conditions, and you can do it under, tre under uh, tree cover. This is from Kamloops um, in some heavily treed pasture where they used it to get some cattle out of the bush. Uh, this is from Thompson Rivers University as well. The guru of cattle and drones is at TRU, uh, Dr. John Church, and he uses it for beef genetics. He's breeding heat uh, tolerance into cattle and using it to measure the difference between those two different breeds by measuring their surface temperature or by measuring their respiration rate in resting conditions with the drone being positioned over them where the, there's zero stress. Um, this is something that AFSC does, our Alberta Financial Services Corp. They're the crop insurance people. Um, you can now send imagery from a consumer drone to them, start combining your grain, and they will send you an insurance claim for the trampled crop by large elk herds. You can count cattle with it, being used all the time by feedlots now, and the tool is amazing for on-farm emergencies. This is an anhydrous ammonia tank that's leaking. This is just an example. Most of the on-farm emergencies are a little bit uh, more dangerous. And uh, the 3Ds, dangerous is definitely one of those. So farmers are often left to their own devices to make sure that their stuff is safe. And confronting people with a gun is a really bad idea. Flying over with a drone is a good idea. They have no idea where you are. It was great to see QR codes today. I encourage you to pull out your smartphone and give this a try. This is something very simple that my pilots do when we map any field. You get these red and green maps, NDVI maps, and they're a great data source, but they don't tell you what crop was being grown that day, what the weather conditions were like that day, was it a tall or a short crop. And these 360 panels take about two to three minutes per quarter section. So what you're looking at is our home farm. We farm almost 9,000 acres. Those panoramas were created in a single day. It's not data, but it's sure a great way to record what was happening on those fields. We do this once a season just to be able to record what the crops looked like that year. So when something else is going wrong five or ten years from now, we can figure out what might have caused that in the past. This is also great for real estate. I don't know why it isn't being used routinely for farmland sales. Um, I see a lot of farmland sales where the picture of in the MLS listing is a fence post with some crop behind it. So great way to sell land. So I want to get now to pass the tool to the implement stage. And this is something that has happened incredibly quickly at Crop Production Show in Saskatoon in January of last year, 2022, is where everything changed for me in this space. Farmers came to the booth and wanted to figure out how to refill the, drone, the spraying drone. They had never flown a spraying drone. They had never flown a drone but they needed to spray their crops and they had been looking at 650, 750, 850,000 dollar sprayers. That's how much a sprayer costs nowadays. They wandered by past my booth and I told them it was between 25 and 40,000 dollars, but you'd need 3 of these to replace your sprayer. So they are at 115,000 dollar hardware cost versus 750 to cover the same amount of acreage. Farmer seed is an implement and they're ready to buy. There's a problem. Uh, there's a pesticide management regulatory agency and we pride ourselves in Canada on our food safety. So they've taken a different approach from the EPA. In Canada, drone application is not considered aerial application. Uh, it is considered a novel application method 
and they're waiting for the chemical manufacturers to come to them product by product to ask for drone to be added to that label. That will take eight to 10 years, I would guess. Um, but there will be a change. I mean, common sense eventually will prevail and they do want some evidence that drone application is as safe as aerial application and I'm hoping this paradigm will change because this is the implement that you're looking at. This is a typical pasture in central Alberta. You get weeds growing on that. Many of them noxious weeds that need to be controlled by legislation. You need to go control those, but also brush that it's just a good idea to control to maintain the, the productivity of that land. So we've got two different devices here on that same field. Which one do you think is the better device for it? Which one's hitting the target more accurately? Which one's uh, more safer for the operator, both from the chemical perspective and the mechanical perspective? There is no equivalent tool to a drone for this use. You can't get a custom operator with a 120-foot sprayer to come out to most of these pastures because they're too rough and they're beating their equipment up too hard. There are many use cases like this. And uh, those low-hanging fruit are going to adopt very quickly once the regulations allow it. So we started our journey with spraying drones in 2021. I've been in this drone, agricultural drone space. I put my blinders on. I don't want to talk about uh, mining and all the other stuff that has big bucks. I want to talk about agriculture where people are tight with their money. But it's, where I'm, it's what I'm passionate about. I never touched a spraying drone until 2021. And at that point, I kicked myself for not starting in the spraying business earlier because the equipment was just beautiful. We weren't enamored with it, so we took lots of pictures of our new spraying drone. We had a, an expert in, drone, in spraying nozzles come out to calibrate it with us for that first visit, and both of us were just blown away. We thought that DJI had, those of you that have flown a DJI drone, had kind of uh, exaggerated a little bit on, fly, on things like flying time and acreage coverage. Um, when they advertise something is flying for 47 minutes, I sell the stuff. It actually flies 30, 35, right? Drastically exaggerated. That wasn't the case for the spraying drones. They actually cover incredible amounts of acres, and it's all because there's a virtual boom. So you've got this relatively small implement with all that turbulent air, and as long as you put the droplets into that air at the right place, it distributes it relatively uniformly without having a lot of boom space hanging way out there. Our newest model, a T40, a 40 liter drone, has an 11 meter wide, 36 foot pass when it sprays. So it's covering 30 to 35 acres in an hour, realistically, in field conditions. Um, so this last guy goes unnamed because I told you about the PMR issue, but there are farmers that are applying product now without our regulatory agencies knowing who they are, um, and they're spraying entire farms with nothing but a drone. This guy owned one T30 last year, which total value is $35,000, owns 1,200 acres, sprayed every, every acre of every product that he applies on his farm. So this is very real, and uh, I'll skip this because I'm out of time and need to take some questions. Um, this is ultimately what drones do now. People are using them primarily to double-check management decisions and scouting, see inaccessible areas quickly, and ultimately discover things that are wrong on their farm that they didn't know about. And uh, one last plug, we do an ag drone school, and we do these everywhere. So we get people from other industries, and we let them in the door, too, um, that come to us just because we did certification, a basic certificate. We do them all over Western Canada. So we hit all the hot spots, uh, like Ready Made Hall out here, uh, Castles Community um, Hall out in Brooks. So we'll see some of you hopefully this spring. Thank you very much, Marcus. Uh, those of you out there, start putting your Slido questions up. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of personal history here. I was born in Calgary, and actually my first uh, career venture, I became a commercially licensed multi-engine IFR. You'll notice I'm not flying at the moment. And then I had the uh, secondary industry, and I've worked at SAIT, and I worked at an institution in BC, and I had the opportunity to work for Olds College. 
And one thing I discovered there, I'll call it the casual sophistication of agriculture. There's just so much that's going on uh, with technology and the way that you optimize and work with the economy is very impressive. I'm always amazed. So, so questions. Uh, what company would be best to look into for an ag student wanting to work with drones? I'll assume that the question is specifically about agriculture, um, and we are recruiting right now. We balloon from three staff in the wintertime to about, this year it'll be nine or ten in the summertime, and we recruit from Olds College and Lakeland College primarily because they have such great ag schools that teach students the ag tech um, details. So we do hire ourselves. The other thing they can do is set up their own business. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for one-man operations uh, in the drone space. Thank you. Uh, do insurance companies provide a deduction based on a farmer's consistent drone monitoring? That's a great question. I wasn't, I, I'm not aware of anyone that is. Um, for most monitoring, people are just using satellite as well. And there are some that are doing this for things like uh, carbon sequestration protocols and nitrous oxide emission protocols where the satellite will be used to monitor tillage events and that can lead to some payments to the farmers. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, how do you collaborate with post-secondaries with your drone school? <laughs> so we do, uh, I noticed on Rogers there was a drone school for farmers and agronomists at Olds College. Uh, that's our ag drone school just delivered under another banner. Uh, we do the same thing with Lakeland College, Northern Lakes College, Great Plains College, Cumberland College. Um, it's, it's usually their continuing education arm um, that's being used for that. Uh, we also provide our certification training kind of behind the scenes as free content for the schools as well. Because we've already built the curriculum, so we share it with them so they can get their students certified. Thank you. Have you seen any farms utilizing humic and fulvic acid applications with drone sprayers? Fred? Are you at the viewing party over there somewhere? Um, my brother-in-law <laughs> is really into regenerative agriculture and we test absolutely everything we can, including humic and fulvic acids that we've applied both in mixes with other things and otherwise. Um, in past years, it was all just a single strip. Uh, in future years, I'll make sure that we have replicated trials so that we get good data from it. Um, the other thing we do that's very similar to that and might interest the same person is Almost every drone that we sell for spraying, we also sell with a spreader, and it's great for cover crop applications. So I've got people buying them now um, to do things like seeding wheat, winter wheat into a standing corn crop, and uh, then grazing that winter wheat in the fall, uh, because you can apply midsummer with an aerial device. So uh, next one is how you, or how do you foresee, or do you foresee the pesticide regulatory departments approving use in a more expedited manner? So I mean, it would be ideal if, uh, if a decision had been made similar to what the EPA did. The EPA in the US, their decision was that the drone is an aircraft for all other legislative purposes. We consider it an aircraft and we regulate it as one. So they said that anything, that any product that could be applied by an air, aircraft could be applied by a drone at the same rates with the same requirements. That would be ideal if we can get the PMRA decision on how to have that finding. Um, the EPA did have one little disclaimer, unless the state objects. So there are a few states that are still waiting for better evidence that, uh, that a drone is safe to use. Um, that would be the hope. What we're doing here in Canada, because there is a desire for evidence, is we're spending eight weeks this spring doing nothing but drift trials. So every day when there is a wind between 10 and 25 kilometer an hour, we'll have a layout where we're going to fly perpendicular to that, capture fluorescent dyes in petri dishes, and have that analyzed by a third party to provide that data to PMRA about uh, drift, because that's one of their big concerns. The other concern is human exposure, and I think a big part of that is Many of the spraying drones that you'll come across in, on the internet or on, go on YouTube uh, are being filled with a bucket being poured into the top and stirred in the bucket with a stick. Um, the human exposure actually is much lower for a lot of scenarios, especially orchards. I have a friend that's got an apple orchard in, uh, in Kelowna, and it's just incredible how much they need to protect their crop. And they're doing it with blast, air blast sprayers where they're literally, literally wearing a Tyvek suit and driving through this mist. And the drone is just a much better tool. So 
It will change, it's just a matter of time, and it takes evidence and it takes lobbying too, so um, we normally do that with agricultural organizations rather than drone organizations, but there's definitely some room for more voices uh, to be heard in Ottawa. It's a, actually, I, I'm, I might miss a couple of the Slido questions because they're scrolling faster than I'm asking. One was about the advantages that you see for revenue and farm management. What, what are drones doing in that zone? So the reason that one farmer uh, that I had on the slide sprayed his entire farm is because he didn't own a sprayer and the hardware was cheap. The other benefit that he figured out during the season is he no longer had spray tracks. That was 3% of his farm that he won back by applying chemical above the crop instead of driving through it. 3% on a quarter section of canola is about $40 an acre or $6,000 for a quarter section. Um, those of you not from, ag from agriculture, quarter section, I normally I explain it in central Alberta, it's from the trees to the trees, but that wouldn't work very well here in Medicine Hat. Um, we named it's good money. So for a typical farm, we're talking 6,000 times 10,000, $600,000 a year difference from using a drone sprayer rather than a, 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 a ground sprayer. Okay. Well, and there's many other use cases, but that's one. Thank you. I have one, one more question that we have a slight alteration to the agenda. Have you noticed or do you work with any of the applied research centers? Um, I'm not sure who the applied research centers are. I work with the applied research associations, if that's who you mean. Uh, there, Alberta has a great group of extension and research agencies right across the province and they host our schools a lot of the time. So they'll bring us to their community and then we work in collaboration with them to bring it to the farm community and, and get the word out there how great a tool this is. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much for the questions and for your responses and for the presentation. If you're concerned about a Slido question that has not been answered, we do have a way of collating them and we will make sure that we find a way of delivering answers uh, through the post-conference engagement. So thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much.